So let me first acknowledge my co-authors, uh, Silwin, uh, who is presenting with me, as uh, she last mentioned, Jean and uh, Dr. Albert. We are also very gr much grateful for the guidance and comments we obtained from Dr. Witada and Dr. Ferracani, who have guided us uh, in completing this work. Uh, this study assesses the Philippine readiness for regional digital trade integration with Asia Pacific by providing an analytical overview of the Philippine digital trade environment. And this report serves as a guide to crafting the Philippines National Action Plan, which we will also hear later for digital trade integration with Asia Pacific. So the main objectives of this study include utilizing the digital the regional digital trade integration index to measure the Philippines readiness for integrating itself with the Asia Pacific and exploring the Philippines involvement in international collaborations for digital trade integration. Finally, we will provide um, recommendations and policy for policy interventions in areas critical for regional and digital trade integration. So in the next slide, we want to hear about why regional trade uh, integration is worth studying. So in 2019, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, or UNCTAD, identified several key points about the digital economy. For instance, they noted that the growing power of the digital platforms has global implications and that countries must be ready to create and to capture uh, digital value. As we have heard from Dr. Reyes's um, introductory remarks, the Philippines has three main um, characteristics, um, which are also the reasons to pursue better regional digital uh, trade integration. First is the importance of um, e-commerce or as a component of digital trade in internationalizing the Philippine MSMEs. Second is the country's active digital economy, which we have heard um, as cited that uh, around the, the in 2020, the Philippines digital economy grew slightly from uh, $7.1 billion to $7.5 billion. And this is despite the pandemic. And the Philippines' strong position as a net exporter of digitally deliverable services, which amounts to around 3.6% of uh, GDP in 2019. And again, these are uh, key reasons enough to pursue better regional digital trade integration. But we also heard from Dr. Reyes that um, our world is now faced by new challenges coming from emerging issues about cross-border data flows and intellectual property and many other things. So in this new world where geographical barriers are rapidly fading, we must be able to understand how to collaborate with our neighbors in the region. But this collaboration requires countries to review and update their policies and regulations in order to make the digital economy work for the many and not just for the few. In a digital world, our domestic concerns are also regional concerns. And this is why it is important for us to study and understand the implications of regional digital trade integration for the Philippines. We also find it important to ask ourselves just how ready are we to integrate. In the next slide, let me just talk about the framework that we are using for this study. So measuring the Philippines' readiness for digital trade integration requires a specialized regional index. So in 2020, UNSCAP developed the Regional Digital Trade Integration Index, or RDTII, that captures regional integration perspectives, specifically in the Asia-Pacific region. The RDTII understands that the digital trade integration is enabled by lower barriers for digital trade and higher levels of network openness, which is why the RDTII has 11 pillars exploring not just the traditional barriers, such as uh, Pillar 1, the tariff and trade defense, but also the presence of enablers affecting connectivity, such as cross-border data policies, Pillar 6, IPR, Pillar 4, and Infrastructure and Competition, Pillar 5. So each entry in the RDTII gets a score that goes from zero, which means not restricted, zero, and to one most restricted. And how did we utilize this? So we operationalized the RDTII by conducting a comprehensive review with the guidance of UNSCAP and um, Martina of primary texts and secondary reports from reliable institutions, such as the United States um, Trade Representative or the USTR, um, and other 
in other documents. So we looked at the executive documents, presidential decrees, executive orders, department orders are circulars, memorandum circulars, regulatory opinions, and also legislative documents such as, of course, our constitution, republic acts, and even um, proposed uh, bills, House bills and Senate bills. We also looked at Supreme Court rulings and also secondary reports. In addition, um, we also conducted a number of uh, workshops designed to validate and to verify the accuracy of our uh, study assessment. The workshops in, invited representatives from both the private and the public sectors, particularly for the foreign private sector, we in, including um, chambers of commerce and industry and multinational companies. For the domestic private sector, we invited um, industry associations, business groups, and industry specialists. And for the public sector, we invited the um, key departments and attached agencies representatives from Congress, and independent government bodies. So the consultation workshops were conducted in April of this year, and around 29 institutions and offices representing a um, number of um, uh, were represented. So the consultation, um, the results of the consultation are actually available in the paper as an, an appendix. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so in this slide, let me now call my um, able uh, partner. So, Silvin, please take over. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So, what you're seeing right now is an overall assessment of the Philippines. And I want you to look at table one first because this would show you the individual scores per pillar together with the remarks on its restrictiveness. Now, I don't I won't be going over all these scores for now because later on I'll be presenting our insights based on this assessment. But what I want you to know is that the Philippines has three non-restrictive pillars, which is a good thing, but it also has three strongly restrictive pillars, which can be quite challenging. Now, another point is that the Philippines has an overall score of 0 0.342, which we can interpret as slightly restrictive. <laughs> Now, we can also interpret this as the Philippines having a relatively open digital trade environment in 2020. But how does this score compare with the rest of the Asia Pacific? Figure one will show you that the Philippines has actually performed better than the regional average of 0 0.42. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'll be presenting a total of seven insights, and I'll be starting with the more positive messages before I go with the more challenging ones. So the first insight test is that the Philippines has an exceptionally low tariffs on digital goods, and this synergizes well with having only slightly restrictive NTMs. Now, figure 2A would show you the effectively applied tariff rates, which has been reducing since 2015. And figure 2B would show you the coverage rate of duty-free digital goods imported from the Asia Pacific, which has been increasing since 2015. Now, what does figure 2 tells us? It tells us that the importation of digital goods remains unhampered insofar as tariffs are concerned. But there are some issues related to NTMs. And two things. First is that the trade of dual-use strategic goods are highly regulated. Now, these strategic goods can include computers, electronics, and telecoms that meet a certain technical standard that would make it fit for both military and civilian use. Now, we do acknowledge that the strategic trade control is something being practiced internationally. And we also recognize that the Strategic Management Office implements policies that are consistent with international best practices. However, we still con continue to include this measure because it, it can increase trade costs, thereby making trade more restrictive. The second issue is that there is a lack of self-certification for product safety, but I won't go over that too much anymore. Next slide, please. Okay, so our second insight is that there has been a continuous improvement on IPR enforcement, and this complements the Philippines' already liberal access to online content. Now, figure three would show you that intellectual property protection in ASEAN has been increasing, and that includes the Philippines as well. But there are still some issues related to this. Two things. Digital piracy remains high in the Philippines. In fact, in 2017, 
this was estimated at 64%. And this can be quite alarming because having a high digital piracy rate can make the Philippines more vulnerable to cyber attacks. And when you're more vulnerable to cyber attacks, you tend to become less safe, less trustworthy, and this can scare off foreign investors from entering the market. The second issue is related to content-specific safe harbor clauses. Now, safe harbor clauses are important because this allows online intermediaries to provide a wide range of services without the fear of incurring legal liability whenever a user conducts something illegal using their platform. Now, in the Philippines, there are two safe harbor clauses, which we can find from the Electronic Commerce Act and the Cyber Crime Prevention Act. Now, these two clauses are content-specific, though, where, where the former is applied on electronic good uh, documents, while the latter is applied on cyber crimes defined under the law. Next slide, please. Okay, our third insight is that the Philippines has strong policies on data. Figure four will show you the business to consumer use in the ASEAN, and this, and this has also been increasing in the past few years. This suggests to us that Philippine businesses are able to comply with data policies, but at the same time still continue to grow. But what's the possible issue from arising from data policies? Well, there are trade costs that could arise from data retention and data privacy compliance. And this could possibly be felt more than by MSMEs than large firms because MSMEs have less resources to to use for complying to these policies. Now, I, I added some examples here, but I won't be going through them in detail. Next slide, please. Okay, so we're starting with the more challenging messages now. The fourth insight is that foreign equity limitations can possibly ban foreign equity on some e-commerce and irritating, therefore restricting digital trade from growing. Now, what's the issue? Uh, we all know that mass media activity uh, cannot have foreign equity. But the problem is that the definition of mass media activity is found in different legislations and uh, regulatory opinions. Therefore, there's no single definition of what constitutes mass media activity. Now, the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, issued a, an opinion in 2018 which provided some guidelines on how they would determine whether a business activity would be considered as mass media or whether it would be considered as advertising. And the, the, the possibly worrisome part here is that the SEC does this determination through a case-by-case -case approach. And doing this kind of approach can make an environment that is uncertain. And when an environment is uncertain, this can scare off or discourage foreign investors from entering the market. Next slide, please. Okay, so our fifth assessment is that highly discouraging policies affect foreign bidders' participation to public procurement. Now, there are two groups here, consultants and bidders, but I would be focusing more on the bidders' part. Now, foreign bidders face a 15% domestic price preference. Now, this is okay because, of course, we want to support our domestic economy, but this domestic preference could become problematic if it can create inefficiencies. So for instance, there were cases where local bidders were awarded a project, but they, were, they do not have the capacity to fulfill that project. Therefore, these local bidders end up subcontracting a foreign supplier, which could have been awarded the project in the first place. Now, the second issue has to do with the local reference requirement. Now, a local reference is required from foreign bidders who want to participate in infrastructure projects. But the problem with, the, but this create can create a problem in the digital economy because digital infrastructure can be quite new. Therefore, it would have been impossible for these foreign bidders to present a local reference to begin with. And since they cannot present a local reference, they're effectively prevented from participating in this infrastructure public uh, projects, public procurement. Now, the third issue has to do with foreign equity limitations, but I won't go over that anymore. Next slide, please. Okay, our sixth insight is that there are strong barriers to entry restricting the Philippine telecommunications sector. Now, figure five will show you the infrastructure performance in the ASEAN 5, 
but I want you to focus in the Philippines. Notice that the Philippines has been relatively stable throughout this time period, which suggests to us that there has been no significant improvement in how infrastructure is being developed in the country. And this infrastructure also includes the telecommunication sector. Now, what are the possible issues? Four things. First, it could be because of the lack of local loop unbundling, which can prevent healthy competition. Second, it could be because of foreign equity limitations to public utilities, which caps foreign equity to just 40%. But I think the most restrictive ones are coming from the bottom two, which are the legislative franchise from Congress and strict licensing requirements, such as the CPCN. Now, these two can take up several years, and since they take up so many years, it can be both time consuming and expensive. Next slide, please. Okay, so our last insight has to do with the infrastructure gap on both ICT and transportation, and this can adversely affect online sales and transactions. Earlier, I already showed you figure five about the general condition of infrastructure, but I want to add here figure six, which shows you the cell tower density in ASEAN, and you see that the Philippines has 70 towers per 1,000 square kilometers. And this lags behind Thailand's 92.5 and Vietnam's 166 towers. Another point is that this probably affects e-commerce more because even though transactions occur electronically or digitally, the goods remain to be physical. And since these goods are physical, they need to go through logistics services in order to arrive to the consumer. And a good logistics service it depends on a good and reliable transportation infrastructure. So this infrastructure gap can, can adversely affect online sales and transactions. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'll be giving the main takeaway. Earlier, I already showed you that the Philippines has performed better than the Asia Pacific. And we've also shown you the strengths and weaknesses of the Philippines. But despite all these weaknesses, we do believe that the Philippines is ready for regional digital trade integration with the Asia Pacific. However, we do note that uh, the, the Philippine government uh, needs to improve on the implementation of certain policies and create or amend uh, laws that would be, enable it to address emerging issues in the, in the digital economy. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'll return the floor to Sir Francis since he will be presenting this slide for us. Thank you. All right, so just a very quick um, summary of ways forward and policy recommendations. After hearing the issues, we just want to mention that there are two main um, branches of policy recommendations to address the remaining issues for digital trade integration. The first one would be the low hanging fruits because these are the ones that could be easily achieved without uh, uh, through executive um, uh, policies. Uh, for instance, the continuing uh, Philippine participation in international cooperation initiatives, such as the ITA-1, ITA-2, and the Joint uh, Statement Initiative, uh, reducing digital piracy by strengthening digital enforcement capacity, and the, removing, the removal of the case-by-case -case determination of mass media. Another would be the quantifying the cost of policies restricting foreign equity participation in telecommunications and electronic commerce, and this would involve um, uh, heavy research. Another branch would be the whole of government, and this would involve coordination of branches of government. For example, this would include the, um, removing the limits to the in the constitution and the passing of bills currently being discussed, such as the e-government bill or HB uh, 1248, and in addition, amending old ones, such as the Government Procurement Act. So um, we will hear uh, additional policy recommendations from the National Action Plan, which will be presented late, um, after this by uh, Dr. Farrakhani. Uh, thank you, everyone.